Women Who Own It podcast spotlights women business owners who are pioneers in their field, setting trends, blazing trails, and creating game-changing innovations. Brought to you by WeBank, the largest certifier of women-owned businesses in the U.S. and a leading advocate for women business owners and entrepreneurs. And me, Allison Maslins. I've been a business owner for the last 35 years. I'm the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of the book, Scale or Fail. So join our bold community of women who built it, grew it, and own it. I'll see you on the show. Welcome to Women Who Own It podcast brought to you by WeBank, the largest certifier of women-owned businesses, I am your host, Allison Maslin, and I am the CEO and founder of Pinnacle Global Network, where we mentor business owners around the world to grow and scale their companies. Now, Women Who Own It podcast is brought to you by women business leaders for women business leaders, and that's what WeBank does. They really support the women-owned business all over the country, and so by learning from these amazing women business leaders, how they've done it, how they started, how they've grown their business. Our hope is that it will help make the road for you so much easier. And today our guest is Kate McAleer, and she is the owner and founder of Bixby and Company, an artisan confectionery producer located in the historic working waterfront of Rockland, Maine. Founded in 2011 to produce and sell unique, natural, and organic chocolate products. One of my favorite topics in the whole wide world. So besides uh, holding a bachelor's degree from New York University, she also holds diplomas in pastry arts and culinary management from the Institute of Culinary Education in New York City. The organic chocolates are currently sold across the country in over 3,000 specialty and natural food stores. So she has been very busy. Um, She's been the Small Business Administration's Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Maine and Tory Birch Foundation Fellow. And she also won the Pitch Prize for Tory Birch for $100,000. And in 2017, Kate and Bixby and Company launched the first bean to bar chocolate production in the state of Maine, sourcing cacao directly from farmers and processing a complete chocolate product from the bean through to the end chocolates. We're going to hear all about this and lots of business tips. So Kate, welcome to Women Who Own It. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Yeah, so your story is super interesting. And I, you know, as you and I are talking, it's actually uh, only a few uh, women owned uh, chocolate producing factories and all of the other things that you do. I know you're organic and this is very rare. So tell us a little bit about your backstory. How did this all start? Sure. So I've done a lot of reflecting on where did all of this chocolate uh, fanaticism come from. And so it starts as a young child. I really love chocolate. I was always, you know, I think there's two types of dessert people, fruit or chocolate. And I was always the chocolate everything. Um, And then fast forward a little bit. I did some pretty extraordinary high school study abroad programs, um, which were incredibly uh, pivotal moments in my life where I spent my junior year of high school in France, living with a host family, attending an American school. And then my senior year of high school, I lived in Beijing, China. And I think both experiences were completely different on the spectrum, but in- really opened my eyes to culture and food and history. And then fast forward again a little further. I was in college majoring in East Asian studies. So I was continuing the language focus as well as minoring in French and art history. So it was very liberal arts focused. Um, uh, My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer in college. Um, So there was this moment where you, you know, take in 
what is going on? Why is this cancer happening, et cetera? And you're also in college, a lot of, I think a lot of thinking is going on when one's in college, a lot of forming of who you're gonna become. And I was really, uh, did a lot of research on organic and natural foods. And one of the number one triggers to switch to organic food is, is a health moment in one's family or personal life. And so we really started to look at the food we were eating as a family. And I was playing varsity golf in college. And, you know, there's a lot of snacking that happens on the golf course because you're walking and carrying your clubs for 18 holes. And you go to three day tournaments um, and candies all over the golf course. And I would read the ingredients because, you know, now I'm becoming aware. And they were all ingredients that didn't really hold up to the new standards we had as a family. So I started to do some market research and saw a void in the space of organic and natural confectionery products. And, and so then that became the, I guess, the starting point of creating Bixby and creating an organic and natural solution to the void that we saw in the marketplace. Wow. Isn't it interesting how all of these things converge, you know, to, to lead you down a path. I mean, to have that experience in high school, I always feel traveling is the best education. So opened your eyes to this whole other world, right? And then what your mom went through, uh, and, you know, for you to find a way to help her get healthy and, and all of that. And, and then you two both work in the business together. Is that right? Yes. So my mom and I started and founded the business. She um, is a thriver and survivor of the breast cancer. And um, we, you know, she was retiring from her previous career. I was starting mine. And we thought, wow, this could be an amazing time in our lives together and a unique time where I grew up seeing my mom with her career um, and spending a lot of time watching her and admiring her. And she was probably my first mentor. Um, And so to be able to work with her (laughs) in a startup small business was fun. And we, you know, I was the millennial, she was the baby boomer. Um, We brought a lot of different skill sets together. Um, And it's been really an honor to be able to work with her for the past almost 10 years uh, to learn from her and work with her in that capacity as um, a business owner and executive. Um, and she's also my mother. So it has yeah, been- that's amazing. And it's so great. You have uh, so many different, obviously experiences and eras to bring to the table and that you all get along so well too. That's great. <laughs> it's not always the case. So um, you also uh, with Bixby and company is a socially responsible business. You support the community. uh, And I love the saying I got on your website, chocolates made with a conscience. Mm -hmm. That's a really, that's awesome. That says it all. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And what, what is your, your why behind that? Absolutely. So in looking in all the research I did, there are a lot of issues around cacao and other foods, frankly, it's not just cocoa, but around ethical considerations in the sense of use of child and slave labor, um, use of herbicides and pesticides, burning of the rainforest. There's a lot of myriad of issues. And when we started the company, we wanted to make sure we had chocolate that was ethically responsible. And and then we took it even a step further in launching the bean to bar line of directly sourcing the cacao um, from predominantly Central and South American countries. So the majority of the world's cocoa, for example, I I think it's, I mean, there's different numbers, but one I'll quote is maybe 90% of the world's cocoa is coming from West Africa. Mm -hmm. With with a lot of issues around it. Um, So we were sourcing these Uh, more premium and harder to find beans that are smaller lots and from Haiti, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, and Belize, and really highlighting these different origins. Um, Chocolate is similar in a lot of ways to coffee and different in a lot of other ways, but that became one of our 
I, I call it our Hokator line of products um, because the market still, I don't think is totally there for extremely high-end products, but we wanted to bring that to market, bring it to Maine, our state, and pay above commodity market prices for the cocoa beans from which we source in these countries. Yeah, that that makes a huge difference. I mean, you're not continuing to support uh, you know, something that's obviously been a problem there for a long time. And I think, you know, a lot of consumers like me are are not aware of that, of what's, you know, you're just getting the chocolate bar. But to be able to have that confidence and know um, that it's coming from a good place on the other side of that is, I think, makes a big difference. And it's important to educate the public about that. And I also love that, too, because I think that um, I know myself and so many other business owners that we work with and support to be able to have a business that's a conscious business that really is making a big difference beyond the consumer is it is such a good thing and I think really desired right now. Yes, one of the things that that was really eye opening in, in some of my travels on cocoa sourcing trips was this disconnect between the farmer and the consumer. So for example, some of the cacao growing countries don't consume chocolate as we know it as a Western sort of concept of a bar or a confection or a piece of chocolate. They eat the cocoa fruit um, or a form of sort of drinking chocolate. Um, so it was even interesting to de-layer some of the history and culture of, of chocolate and realize that there's these people who grow the fruit and they're so critical to the end product and how it tastes and the flavor. Uh, and yet they don't even eat chocolate in the way we do in some origins. Yeah, that's so interesting. Now on the business side, uh, when you started out, it was mm -hmm. you and your mom, and you've obviously grown in 3,000 stores. There's a lot of different steps and pieces to your business, I would imagine. Yes. Um, was it hard for you to start building a team, uh, to start delegating and letting go? I know it's one of the toughest things that business owners struggle with as they're growing. Absolutely. I think that we are, and my mom uh, is in particular, very particular about quality and um, we try and make the best product we possibly can. And, and so we're fanatical about quality. And yeah, so then we, we go in and um, I, great, it's a great point. No, we have not been able to delegate everything. We're still very much involved in a lot of aspects, but that's what we love to do. And it's part of our passion, but we do have an amazing team, we could not do it without them. And, and it's people that have come from a variety of different backgrounds. And um, we have um, quite a nice young crew right now that just graduated from high school and entering the workforce. And then a lot of seasoned folks that came from all sorts of different backgrounds because chocolate manufacturing is quite interesting. It, it, it has an allure that it's chocolate, but it is also food manufacturing. So we have a lot of systems of food safety and um, quality control that we have to implement. And you'll definitely have your Lucille Ball moment. Um, I tell everyone <laughs> when you're on the line and it just feels impossible to keep up. And when you say it's okay, you just pause and we can stop <laughs> and catch up. So. Yeah. You mean you're not like shoving it in her, your mouth? like she was. <laughs> That was like my favorite scene, I think, ever with Lucy. Um, but yeah, I, I would imagine. And we do work with, uh, in, in Pinnacle, my company, we do work with some other food manufacturers. So I'm very familiar. Uh, and yeah, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. You have to have a love and passion for what you do. And you clearly do. Um, and you clearly do care. What are some lessons, speaking of team, that you've learned over the years uh, that you've been running your business that you didn't know when you started? You know, it's, it's interesting. I think that what is key is to find 
people that love to um, work in kind of this niche category. So it, it offers a lot of fun and challenge at the same time. So I think personality and ability to adapt and navigate and handle problems has been something that was key to building a great team. And, you know, even myself, I've had to learn how to deal with all the various challenges that can come one's way. And so I think that adaptability and flexibility has been key. And then, um, you know, we do a lot of training and I think that that is a great differentiator in the sense that there's no, you know, history of um, chocolate making where we are, for example. So there's a lot of fishing industry, um, but we, train and bring people along to do our unique specialty. Yeah, I, I love that you said that because I think that oftentimes uh, as business owners, we, we're so busy and we can get really frustrated when uh, a team member is not stepping up fast enough. But when we sort of peel back the, the curtain, we see, well, this person really wasn't trained well enough. Mm -hmm. to, you know, to really understand what to do and, um, and to be able to understand the expectations, like what does success look like? Mm -hmm. So that's really awesome that you're offering this training, because I think a lot of times business owners think training is the, you know, learn to swim method where you just throw them in the pool and say, okay, get going. <laughs> And so uh, I think that makes a huge difference in the success. It takes a little longer up front, but it saves you from a lot of headache later on. Absolutely. I think you need beginning, ongoing, and reinforced training <laughs> at all times. Um, and so I think that's been something that you just have to kind of reiterate and use teaching moments also, I think is really helpful. Yeah, that's great. Now, you, as I read your intro, you've won some amazing grants, and I would imagine that that uh, helps you a lot in getting this business going. Absolutely. Is that, can you tell us about that a little bit? Sure. So one of my favorite pastimes is Googling grants for women-owned businesses or grants for small businesses, and I can tell you a little story of... Um, you know, in the beginning of a food business, you have to do a lot of demos, which are sampling events. And I did so many demos in the first three years myself, personally, interacting with customers. And one of the demos I did was at a local winery. And, you know, sometimes you can read the people you're interacting with. And there was this gentleman who asked, you know, not the normal sort of questions. And he was really interesting. And then at the end of this little conversation, he says, you know, you should apply for this accelerator program. And I took notes and took down his information and I followed up. And he uh, introduced me to this accelerator in Maine, which was for startup companies that had just been starting. And I just reached the window where you could apply to get into the next round. And um, went through the accelerator and they also exposed this line of different grants. And they, they all said with a big fat asterisk, you know, food has never been funded before in this particular capacity. And I just went kind of around the corner through another door and <laughs> researching and talking to different people because one person told me I would never, ever, ever get this grant funding because I wasn't some sort of you know, aquaculture or fishing or like, you know, widget manufacturer. <laughs> um, but I did my research on what are the key economic objectives in the state. And again, again, I think this goes back to research. And one of the key objectives is food manufacturing, right? Because we've done so much offshoring of other types of manufacturing as a country. And do we really want all of our food made in China, for example? No, right. we don't. Right. Um, so I was creative in how I went through this grant process and came in under a different category of precision manufacturing and talked about all my differentiations and ended up getting the grant. So it was just an example of perseverance and just trying to 
figure out a way through. And then from there, I've continued to keep abreast of other grant opportunities because as a manufacturer, there are a lot of opportunities for job creation. And in particular, we're in a rural area. So I've tried to leverage all of the aspects of what can make it challenging to manufacture where we challenge and use that as an advantage to pivot into some different programs um, through so many different organizations. There's endless federal and state grant opportunities. Um, and WeBank also promotes all sorts of programs and activities. There's so many more programs now than when we first started also. And, and then and the example in the Tory Birch program, um, just constantly following all sorts of Google search on women-owned grants and pursued applying. Um, I've applied for so many different programs because I think you don't give yourself a shot unless you apply, so. Yeah, well, clearly, which I believe is what creates success in the first place, is that not taking no for an answer or refusing to take no for an answer and then just your persistence right because i think a lot of people would would hear that oh well you're never going to get this grant and then they they think well why put the time and energy and you're like well <laughs> you yeah. just weren't going to take that as as your truth which is really uh you know i i just feel like that's the sign of success so when my team and I work with CEOs and founders to help them grow and scale their business using the scale it method, one of the biggest complaints I hear from business owners is I have no life. I'm working night and day and even though they have a team. And so when we peel back the curtain and see what's really going on is that they are micromanaging every area of their business. They still have their hands in there, even though they have other people that can do the work. Here's the thing, just because you can do something or you've always done something doesn't mean you should continue to do it. That saying what, what got you here won't get you there really applies here. And if you're constantly jumping in and saving the day with your team members or you're showing them how to do it over and over again, where are they going to get the impetus to figure it out on their own or just own it? and have the feeling that you truly trust them. This is how they're gonna learn. This is how they're going to feel like they can show you what they're capable of. So the next time that you get that urge to jump in and redo things exactly the way that you would do it, just take a breath and let your team members shine. This is how they're gonna step up and own it and run with it and this is how you are going to get your life back. It is, and it, it reminds me so much of this book um, written by Angela Duckworthy. She wrote the book, Grit. And I have read that book so many times because I identify it with, with so much. And this is not, this is not, I don't think I was neatly, I had to learn this skill because I used to, when I was younger, kind of take no and then, and then through entrepreneurial journeys, I've, I've had to learn how to turn the no or work at the no. Um, and her book, Grit, which I recommend tremendously, um, was so empowering because it, it helped solidify the fact that other people have had to do that. And, and you, you have to keep working very hard to make and manifest what you, what you dream. So. Yeah, because you're going to hit a lot of walls along the way. And I'm sure the listeners are hearing this going, yeah, I hit that wall and that wall, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you just, you know, the ones that are going to make it are the ones that are going to, you know, find that passage through or climb over the wall or whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. So I love that you have, you know, done your research and I really encourage other businesswomen listening, finding some grants out there and uh because with the grant you don't need to pay it back exactly and it's such critical capital when you're starting out i mean we started the company we had no equipment none <laughs> we hand dipped and hand wrapped our very first order 
um, for Whole Foods Market. And from there, we had to scale and, and build out our factory because there was no vegan organic candy factory, right? It didn't exist at the time. We had to create it. And um, there's just endless need for equipment, frankly, when you're trying to scale a manufacturing business. So all of that effort and um, capital was, was just really critical. Um, and in, also beyond the form of grant, there's loans. So Whole Foods Market, for example, had a local producer loan program, which was a competitive application process. And you had to get on the phone with all the powers that, I don't know if this is still how they do it, but at the time with all the powers that be that had to say, and I was on the phone when they were doing this, yes, we approved Kate. Yes, we approved Kate. And if anyone said no, and this whole team on this phone call, that would have been it. No, no money to buy um, a, a wrapping machine for the candy bars. Um, so you never know, you know, you have to constantly keep up on your relationships and be ready at any moment to jump on opportunities like that one. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you're in over 3000 stores, <laughs> which is incredible. And so what advice do you have for the business owners listening right now, trying to get their products into the retailers? Yes. So I think it's really key to do your research. So, um, you know, in a non-pandemic environment, I would go and research the actual store that I'm trying to pitch, for example, and try and look at their current set. And set would mean the place in the store where you think your product most likely needs to be. And if that doesn't exist, what was the closest space where you suggest your product should be? And, and then doing research on the competition. And, you know, I've always heard that they're going to take someone off the shelf to put you on the shelf. So you need to have a reason for why. And then also um, a lot of research. So I joined specific industry organizations to access, because I can't afford the data myself, but to access industry research. And so for example, if you're trying to position a gluten-free or a vegan product, accessing that data on how fast is that segment growing and then tying that into my presentations. Um, so I'm scrappy, right, and creative. And then um, the other thing is to look for the various supplier diversity programs. So um, I, I think a lot of wee bees can relate to entering their information into endless portals. And I did all of the portals I could think of and always had in the back of my mind thought, is this really gonna work? Is anyone gonna look at this portal? But recently, sure enough, I got an email that said, because you're women-owned certified, we're doing a diversity summit, first ever for food in this particular category. And your name came to the top and we want you to present and pitch for this special program. And so I thought, gosh, all those late night hours of data entry into all these portals, you know, one- Someone is actually reading these, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's because all the portals are different, right? It's not as though you can submit to the one portal. You have to go into each portal and, you know, submit your certificate and all of your information. Um, so that, that's another example. So there's been some amazing supplier diversity uh, programs that because you're registered on the portal, you get invited to and then you can come and pitch or I mean, various retailers do it in different capacities, but anytime that happened, I would drop everything, book a plane ticket and go, or if it was virtual, which would be great if they could go to more towards a virtual format, but, um, you know, and some of them didn't work out, but I got on the radar. I tried to stay in touch, followed up. Um, so I think you have to kind of be crafty and, and keep abreast of these different programs that are taking place. And then also leveraging the women-owned conferences. So um, attending the WeBank conference, um, I was able to meet various biodiversity managers from different retailers um, and tried to nurture those relationships. But it is challenging. I mean, retail is 
very hard because you're up against huge multi-billion dollar conglomerates and you're not able to compete on price because they're going to win on price. So you have to compete on other aspects, right? You have to be differentiated. You have to compete on sometimes even just personality and chutzpah. And I think that um, timing also can be part of it too. So it's just a whole host of aspects that you need to bring to the table to try and to try and enter into a very competitive space. Yeah, yeah, no, that's super smart. And I love that you do your research and uh, really look at what is your differentiator? How, what separates us in the marketplace? And leading with that, I think that's so important. Instead of trying to say, you know, we're better than so-and-so, it's like, how are you different? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that that's something that uh, I would imagine the retailers would be interested in. Now, what, what have been some of the biggest challenges you faced as a business owner, Kate, and, and how have you overcome them? Sure. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges is just being in a very tough, competitive marketplace. And I don't know what other channel would be less competitive. I think people are competing against very large companies in, in almost every segment, you know, as small women-owned businesses. But um, just trying to navigate through, I think, the world of supplier diversity and trying to find the programs that support and uplift the women-owned businesses mm -hmm. as the key. So, um, you know, we've had to say no to some retail partnerships because they didn't offer um, reduced slotting, for example, for women-owned businesses. Um, slotting is a sort of paying rent to access the shelf and right. it can be an absolute financial barrier um thousands and thousands of dollars just to get onto the shelf and that's been something that was was really a big barrier and i decided to look at it through a different lens which was we just need to find the right partners that have programs that uplift versus um you know, tough conversations where you get in and then they ask for a lot of money that you just can't afford. Right. Um, so being diversified also, I think, has been key and having many different tentacles and different, even within channels, we have sub channels of penetration. So I think that that's been way, my way of overcoming what feels like at times huge boulders in your way of success. It's just, okay, we've got to go around the boulder and jump up on this little hill or something. Right. Which takes us back to that persistence, <laughs> uh, which I think of, often, but it does help, you know, like let's find the right wall, you know, like mm -hmm. don't keep beating your head against something that's not working or getting yourself into a situation where I, I know that a lot of business owners do is they're like, okay, well, I'm going to come up with the money for this. And they get into a situation where there's no margin left. And, you know, that they have a lot of cards stacked against them. You know, you got to sell a lot of product to be able to cover that. Um, so I think that's smart. And yeah. it's also very challenging because in the, just the past almost 10 years of being in business, the restrictions on certain just how you ship your product in have changed and become um, very challenging. So, and while you hope uh, every account will be voluminous, <laughs> sometimes they're not. Um, even working with the biggest partners, they some of them have distribution centers that are small. And mm -hmm. um, so I recently faced a challenge where there was a retailer that we were servicing 16 warehouses and one of the new rules that came out was you're no longer able to ship small parcel and I decided to advocate for myself and I went and talked to it took me no less than probably 50 emails and some phone calls to figure out the decision maker and I literally said you know I'm a small business and I'm one of your only women owned in this category. And can you make any kind of exemption 
so I can continue to service this DC profitably and not lose, because you can't ship a pallet that's not a pallet, right? They were, right. there are certain things that are not that big, you just small parcel UPS or FedEx it or something. And so I ended up getting a small parcel exemption. <laughs> wow, Kate, you are, talk about grit. You know, 50 emails. Seriously, I love that you're sharing this because this is the theme that's going through this interview. So for those of you listening, like do not take no for an answer. You know, if you're really passionate about this, and if just keep a problem, try and find an answer because they probably want to help you. You just have to find the right person. And sometimes getting to the right person in a huge company is the biggest challenge. It's just a bureau bureaucratic quagmire. So even in different silos, they don't know who to talk to. But then there's the person who is the person that you just need to find and rationally explain to them the problem. And then they realize, wow, that really is a problem. It must be a problem for some other people too. So. Right. right. Yeah. Because, you know, they need it brought to their attention. So that's fantastic. Now, you're you're in all these retail stores and with covid a lot of businesses shifted or put more energy into digital into their <laughs> direct to consumer market do you feel like for your type of company or just general consumer goods products is it important to do both do you feel like it's you know you put more of your intent uh, attention going into the retail because it's it is almost like two separate businesses. Yes, I mean, we've had e-commerce from day one where you know I built my own website, um, which I don't necessarily recommend, but um, I had no, no skill set in that. And I recently were trying to upgrade our website beyond you know what Kate McAleer made searching YouTube um, because we are trying to dig deeper into direct to consumer because I think it depends on your category also, um, but we find direct-to-consumer is a totally different business. It's very much um, a gift-oriented um, occasion versus personal consumption, if you will, or snacking. And um, you have to run it differently. And, and that's been one of the things that I've been really trying to hone in on is exactly the difference, right? And And I think that, the other thing that's so important is photography. Um, you know, in the beginning, I tried to take my own photos and really investing in photography was a game changer. Um, even, even in presenting to retailers, having good photography has been critical. So, and food photography is a thing, right? To really make that uh, food. Even food, food styling is a thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. Well, you know, it's, it's, I love that you say this and, you know, we, we haven't talked about this much on this show, but it is like different messaging, you know, it is because you're selling direct to the consumer online and then, you know, to the, to the retailer, you're, you're selling to the buyer. So it's a totally different, you know, messaging in a sense. It is absolutely. And then, and then within that we have, um, a whole other channel where we sell to chefs and restaurants um, and that's a totally different dynamic and then we sell to hotels um, and we sell direct to consumer we sell wholesale even to independent small stores and then we also do private label manufacturing so oh wow each, each one is its own different skill set and and challenge unto itself but Yes, direct to consumer, I think is incredibly important. And I'm hoping to learn even more about direct to consumer. I mean, we've, we've had that from the get go. I think the pandemic definitely fast forwarded some consumer um, purchasing behaviors that were maybe a little bit behind. Um, and we're just seeing now an older demographic able to purchase online that may not have been able to in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that you're reaching so many different markets within your market. That's, yeah. uh, that's what we, what we teach, uh, in pinnacle and in, in my book, scale or fail, that's, that's scaling 
And I think that's important for people to hear that because we can get very stuck in one way. And there are so many different ways to get your product out there. So love the creativity. And how have you utilized your WeBank certification? How has WeBank been supportive to you in this process? Yes. So number one, um, I think in like year two of being certified, the woman-owned logo came out. Um, so even before that, I was putting the old WeBank logo on my packaging. Um, and I love that logo and have tried to leverage that tremendously. And so if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's for consumer facing products. You can, if you're a certified WeBe, you can put the it's a beautiful logo on your package. And I, um, even before that existed, was marketing that um, with this older WeBank logo that I was proud to be certified. And um, certification is, is quite a process, as I'm sure everyone <laughs> who's yeah. certified can relate to. You're submitting like three inches worth of paper mm -hmm. um, every <laughs> year <laughs> and scanning it and getting a document notarized which was fun during a pandemic because um, <laughs> it's in person. You can't, you can't do notary over yes. anything. And um, I was just really excited about it all, frankly. I mean, I researched WeBank and then wanted to become certified um, just because it just felt very empowering. And then I remember going to, <laughs> excuse me, my regional meeting and then like a WeBank conference <laughs> and just being totally inspired by all these badass ladies that were there and had huge businesses. And I remember raising my hand in a forum meeting and I was like, can I have a mentor? <laughs> can someone tell me how you all did this? And it was funny because it seemed like I was one of the first young people to have asked this probably in the 2013. Um, and they were like, yes, <laughs> we can we can get you a mentor. Um, so I think what I love about WeBank is it just was so inspiring to see so many successful women that had made it, you know, because it started in the nineties. Um, and it's so empowering to see those success stories and their ability to have grown their businesses to some of them billion dollar, um, mm -hmm. revenue. So, um, and then I've leveraged all the supplier diversity programs, as I mentioned previously, and the logo and really just kind of, I read all the newsletter blasts and I stay abreast of any opportunity. I did the tuck program with IBM and um, Dartmouth. That, that was amazing. Um, and I won one of the scholarships through WeBank for that also. Um, so I think that there's just incredible opportunity and you just have to make sure you're staying on top of it. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm such a fan, obviously, as here is the host of the show. And it's just get, get as involved as you can. And it's such an amazing community of generosity of these business owners that no matter what level that they're at, that they're willing to support. And yes. so you just have to ask like you did. Um, so, well, this has been so great. So as we wrap up here, Kate, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and experience. What is one piece of advice that you would give other women business owners that are wanting to grow their company? My biggest piece of advice is when, when things are getting really tough and, and dark and challenging, um, and if you are really 100% certain this is your calling, you have to, um, you know, Tori Birch said this one thing in one of the programs that when I attended, like negativity is noise. And sometimes you really have to work to shift the energy and then you can have ideas or positive vibes that come. Because sometimes when you're just focused on the dark tunnel, it's so hard to get out of, of that mindset. And I think that um, you have to find a way to persevere and you have to find a way to navigate really rough storms and catch tailwind. And sometimes you have to make your own tailwind. So I think that to me, you know, and it's hard, you have to work at it. It's not, it's not easy. So you have to, I don't know, I've been trying to meditate more and I've been trying to read empowering books um, 
listen to amazing podcasts that are uplifting and just try and kind of manifest more positive energy. Yeah, I love it. I, I love that statement. Negativity is noise. Yes. We have to remember that because there's a lot of it out there and you have to just choose what you're going to tune into and what you're going to ignore. So, mm -hmm. um, well, this is great. And so where, where, what's next for Bixby and company? <laughs> we have some new products that we're working on that I'm really excited about. And we have a incredible, um, smoothie bar line that we're, we're trying to launch. We launched in the pandemic and now really launch, which is a vegan white chocolate um, with Ooh. coconut milk instead of dairy milk and some exciting flavors like golden milk and matcha green tea. So kind of taking a smoothie bowl style of, you know, that plant-based translated into a chocolate bar. Oh my gosh, such creativity. <laughs> well, I can't wait to taste it all. And so those of you listening, definitely reach out and uh, get some Bixby and Company chocolate. And you'll know that it's coming all from a good place. And Kate, thank you so much for being part of the Women Who Own It podcast. Thank you for having me. I, it's, it's a wonderful program. Thank you so much. And for those of you that are listening, if you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and write a review, share your thoughts, what you got out of the episode here. And please share with other women business owners, business leaders about Women Who Own It podcast. Until next time, get out there and elevate yourself because you are worth it. Bye, everybody.